Excellent. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, welcome to everybody for, for joining and thank you for joining the webinar series here. We're going to hear from uh, NG Arctic, the next generation uh, ecosystem experiment from Dr. Uh, Colleen Iverson and Peter Thornton. Uh, next slide. The first thing I'd just like to remind us all here about uh, what U.S. Clivar kind of does and, and why we're all here just quickly so we can remember like at the end we get to our discussion section so we can focus some of our, our questions uh, on some of these topic areas. But U.S. Clivar, uh, we, we foster our understanding and the prediction of climate variability in particular, really at all time scales using observations and modeling with an emphasis on the role of the ocean, but and how it interacts with the other elements of the Earth system. Uh, we serve the climate community and society by coordinating and facilitating research uh, on outstanding science questions, and then coordinate and advance research, particularly within the US, but with, uh, with definitely international collaboration as well. Go ahead, next slide. Within uh, our panel, the process study and model improvement panel, uh, we have a specific mission, which is to reduce uncertainties in general circulation models, uh, which are used for climate variability prediction and climate change prediction, uh, in particular understanding you know, the interconnections uh, of uh, uh, within the system. Uh, next slide. Uh, the last thing are some specific things that we kind of do uh, as a panel, which is review prior to prioritize and coordinate, including like process studies like NG Arctic to hear about them, learn about them and see if we can take lessons learned and, and apply them more broadly to more um, other process studies. Uh, we develop and encourage mechanisms such as community workshops and working groups, et cetera, to help uh, foster the development and implementation of relevant process studies, uh, advise US CLIVAR, and we also liaise with US, other US CLIVAR panels and working groups. Uh, so with that as a broad overview, uh, you can, Jenny, I'll now introduce our speaker so you can uh, toss the ball back to Peter. Uh, today, we're going to hear from, again, NG Arctic, as I mentioned. Uh, the vision of NG Arctic is to advance the predictive power of Earth system models through understanding and structure of the function of Arctic terrestrial ecosystems. The project uh, spans more than 140 scientists and it's been going on for uh, more than uh, about 10 years now. Uh, We'll hear from Dr. Colleen Iverson, who is uh, Deputy Project Director for NG Arctic. Uh, she's an ecosystem ecologist. Uh, sorry, ecosystem ecologist. I think I said that right that time. Uh, she's been at Oak Ridge National Laboratory since 2008. She received her PhD in uh, ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, in 2008. Uh, and Colleen uh, gave a presentation at IARPIC a few months ago, and I thought it would be really useful for our entire group to hear about uh, what specifically what they're doing to engage observationalists and modelers. Uh, we'll also hear from Dr. Peter Thornton. He is the Arctic modeling lead for NG Arctic. Uh, he studies the interactions of land ecosystems with all the components of the Earth system, including biogeochemical, physical land atmosphere feedbacks, and interactions with human systems. Uh, Dr. Thornton has also been at Oak Ridge since 2008, and before that, he spent some time at NCAR. Uh, his current position uh, is Deputy Director of the Climate Change Science Institute at Oak Ridge. So with that, I'll stop taking up all your time, and I'll pass this over to uh, Colleen to Take it away. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, and thanks for the nice introduction and, and for the invitation. Um, and I wanted to say that, you know, I'm speaking as an empiricist as part of the project as the deputy director, but we also have the PI, Stan Wilschlager, here today as well. Um, and so hopefully he'll be available for the discussion as well. Um, and I wanted to um, sort of mention that the NG Arctic project spans four national laboratories. So here at Oak Ridge, but also Los Alamos National Laboratory, Berkeley Laboratory, Brookhaven National Laboratory, and also the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and it's supported by the Biological and Environmental Research Program within the Department of Energy's Office of Science. And I also wanted to mention that we're very lucky to work on the land um, that is the ancestral home of um, Native communities. Um, for example, UIC Science outside of Ukiagvik, Alaska, as well as Mary's Igloo, Sitnasek, and the Council of Native corporations and the field sites we work outside of Nome. And so I wanted to make sure I mentioned that um, before I get started. And unfortunately, it just has my <laughs> my um, website and my Twitter handle there. But um, Stan and Peter are also happy to chat um, with folks anytime. So Peter, if you could go to the next slide. 
So I wanted to show this photo of our team, or at least a portion of our team from the before times. So the NG Arctic project spans 140 scientists across these four national laboratories in the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and um, a large portion of us get together every year for an all hands meeting. This was our last in person all hands meeting in 2019. And I wanted to mention, um, you can see the bright shining faces of our leadership team in this picture as well, which is around 15 people that span institutions and are equally split amongst men and women and also amongst empiricists and modelers. Next slide. So the overarching goal of the NG Arctic project, um, I think is a little bit unique because our overarching goal is to deliver a process rich ecosystem model that spans from the bedrock to the top of where the vegetation interface with the atmosphere and where we think about the evolution of Arctic ecosystems in response to a changing climate and how we can model those processes at the resolution of a high resolution or system model grid cell. Next slide. So that means we have this iterative interaction between empirical observations of ecosystem processes across the Arctic, um, as well as models and model predictions to really develop the system understanding of the Arctic biome. Um, so you can see a sort of our logo on the left there and then on the right hand side, um, which ultimately we want to get to being able to predict things like leaf area index, which is shown here at the, as the resolution of a model grid cell and benchmark that against observations across the Arctic. Next slide. And so the places we make our observations um, are sort of a range across Arctic Alaska. So we work in the, on the continuous and cold permafrost on the north slope of Alaska, as well as further south on sites underlain by discontinuous perma and warmer permafrost um, on the Seward Peninsula of Alaska. Next slide. So in phase one of NG Arctic, which started around 2011, um, we began working in phase one um, in, right outside of Utqiagvik, Alaska, formerly Barrow, on the Barrow Environmental Observatory and working with the native corporation UIC Science to make observations there. Next slide, please. And then in phase two, three years later, we also incorporated additional field sites on this warmer discontinuous permafrost outside of Nome, Alaska um, on the Seward Peninsula. And as I was mentioning before we started the webinar, we work on all the roads that leave Nome, which are three, <laughs> um, and at field sites across those, um, those roads. Um, and also just to say, um, we're now in phase three of NG Arctic, and so we are working in places like Ukiagvik, like outside of Nome, but ultimately we want to extend our inference and our predictability to the Pan Arctic. And so we are actively developing collaborations with folks that are working across Pan Arctic sites and thinking about data synthesis, both within the project and across international um, collaborative efforts. Next slide, please. And so here are some photos of the NG Arctic team working in just the beautiful Arctic um, sites of Alaska. Next slide, please. And we ask a lot of different questions within the NG Arctic project. So our question span, permafrost thaw, shrub expansion, the distribution of water across disturbed and evolving tundra landscapes, and also quantifying the underlying hydrobiogeochemical drivers. And one way to think about that, next slide please, is to think about the Arctic landscape. So this um, illustration is patterned after a diagram that Victor Leszek out of Northern Arizona University drew. Um, he's an amazing artist. And really to show you that the questions that we're asking in NG Arctic span the entirety of the Arctic ecosystem from hydrology to topography to disturbances like fire and thermocarst, thinking about vegetation, shrub expansion, underlying permafrost, and biogeochemical processes processes where carbon dioxide and methane are released to the atmosphere and something we think about a lot with climate change. Um, and also to say we really need to have this perspective because the models care about all of these processes um, and we have to get those right and the model predictions of current tundra ecosystems so that we can be confident in their projections of what happens in the future under a changing climate. Next slide please. 
So the questions that we ask within the project are organized into six different questions and they span um, landscape organization, greenhouse gas uh, fluxes, plant functional traits, shrub expansion, whether the Arctic will become wetter or drier. Um, and those are the five questions we focused on in phases one and two. And for phase three, we added a sixth question, which really focuses on disturbance, which we know is um, increasing and important in Arctic ecosystems. Next slide, please. And so this is where I'm going to hand off to Peter, because as I mentioned, an overarching goal of NG Arctic is to make observations and inform and validate model representation of the Pan-Arctic. And so Peter is going to tell you about that handshake in virtual space as well. Great, thanks, Colleen. The, the challenge that we're facing that Colleen just summarized really well is that we need to be able to improve our ability to predict uh, the processes at, of a very complex system at very large spatial scales when the complexity of that system is expressed across a whole range of spatial scales, going all the way down to the molecular scale with tremendous variability in space and time. And so the observations that are needed in order to do that are very diverse, just showing a sampling here of remote sensing observations, eddy flux observations, single point samples of physical properties, uh, gridded samples of uh, physiological properties of the plants, as well as plant communities, and to a limited extent, some uh, experimental manipulations in the field and also manipulations in the laboratory. All of that, based on the questions that Colleen just described, integrated within a multi-scale modeling framework that allows us to arrive at this largest spatial scale of uh, improved predictions of the pan-arctic tundra system as it uh, operates within a global coupled climate uh, modeling framework and our, our modeling as well as our observations spans this whole range of scales i'm showing you sort of a continuum of scales going down to uh, centimeter resolution over tens of meters all the way up to uh, tens of kilometer resolution at the global scale. Our modeling, in fact, goes even finer down to molecular scales for biogeochemical processes as well. And the key that we have focused on for how to achieve improved understanding across these scales is to have an iterative, uh, an iterative activity between the observations, the experimentation, model development, model uh, application and then learning from all of that uh, as we as we cycle through the uh, model experiment process and the main point that i want to make here is that it is not uh, the case that we have to have a sequential process going through this uh, cycle that i'm illustrating on the right uh, in fact we start at all points simultaneously and are moving around this uh, this cycle uh, as a team of uh, dozens of people and nearly a hundred people I think uh, working working this problem from multiple scales across multiple science questions but with this objective in mind of always evaluating the observations and the experimental knowledge that we're gaining using multi-scale models in order to derive, new understanding and inform additional observations uh, and, and experimentation. We find it useful to categorize the kinds of inputs, uh, the, the kinds of uses that we make within the modeling part of the project of uh, data coming from different parts of the uh, experimental and observational components. We have data that are used to define and parameterize model algorithms. We also have data that are used to constrain, constrain our model boundary conditions. And finally, we have uh, hopefully independent data that are used to evaluate our model outputs. And similarly, we have multiple uses of models in the experimental and observational side of the project, including using process predictions from our multi-scale models to guide the hypothesis development, using those process predictions to guide the next stages of data collection 
and using process predictions to guide our migration of knowledge across scales from the necessarily fine scales where people are working and making observations in the field through the use primarily of remote sensing uh, kinds of observations up to the larger scale of the global system uh, that we're trying to represent within an Earth system model. Fortunately, we are not starting from scratch with this project. We have inherited a very capable Earth system modeling framework, which is the E3SM framework, which is inherited itself from the uh, NCAR uh, community uh, Earth system model, CESM. And uh, that that model includes a very capable land system. And so one of our earlier early objectives was to exercise that land model in a baseline simulation in order to understand how well does it do today or earlier at the beginning of the project, how well does it do in predicting important metrics for uh, the system, showing here a leaf area index that uh, Colleen already mentioned and a panarctic scale simulation using the land model of E3SM and comparing it against MODIS observations as uh, encapsulated within a, a multi uh, observation Evalu model evaluation package called ILAM, which is now actually being extended to the ocean. So some of you may already be familiar with that package. We dig into those baseline simulations uh, in space and time to understand the, what processes are being evaluated or are being simulated well and, and where we think we have uh, improvements to make. And we also use a range of parametric uh, uncertainty quantification, uh, as well as evaluation against independent data sets to uh, quantify our uh, state of knowledge in these baseline simulations. We know that the current highest resolution simulations that are running with the global climate models in E3SM uh, in a coupled framework are, are not as high resolution as we will eventually get to uh, just say in, in the next four or five years. And so at the same time that we're looking at these global scale uh, gridded simulations at say half a degree resolution, we're also looking at a series of very high resolution simulations using the same model, but driven at a one kilometer grid over, uh, this is showing all of North America, but we are uh, focusing for NG Arctic on the, uh, pan, uh, on the Arctic tundra portions of North America. And zooming in on that for the uh, early field studies that uh, have been done in Alaska, uh, we're able to take these baseline simulations and evaluate against uh, multiple observations, again, to try to focus in on where the model development needs the most work. And I'll just show you some examples from a two by two degree uh, window that has on the order of 20,000 uh, grid cells, one kilometer grid cells within it looking at predictions of snow water equivalent in this case for all of the different grid cells in that region. This is focused on one of our Seward Peninsula uh, study regions and uh, as well looking again at uh, predicted snow depth. And we can evaluate these against uh, multiple remote sensing as well as field observations. I'll show you some examples in a little bit about some of the field observations that uh, are, are used to both evaluate these simulations and then to improve them. Based on those uh, simulations with our baseline model, we have arrived at a, a series of topics in addition to the science questions that Colleen mentioned, but which we are describing as our integrated modeling objectives, where we know that there are deficiencies or uh, improvements that could be made within the, within the modeling framework. And we are then focused on using the observations, experimentation, uh, made within the project to, to improve those processes. They include the representation of inundated fractional area within the land model, representation of snow dynamics and how that interacts with terrain and vegetation properties, uh, the representation of the Arctic vegetation itself in terms of uh, the different plant functional types as well as their physiological traits, uh, the representation of biogeochemistry in the soil, including uh, interactions uh, in the litter and peat layers, 
uh, and also representation of dynamics in the vegetation structure uh, over time uh, in the sense of a dynamic biogeography uh, modeling approach. I'm going to take a couple of deep dives into those topics just to give you a sense of the sort of uh, depth that uh, we're, we're uh, exploring these problems in and to give you a sense also of how the multi-scale modeling and observation frameworks fit together for some specific examples. It's important as we dive into this to recognize that uh, the model that we're using, the land model for the E3SM uh, Earth System model, has a, a somewhat unique capability among uh, global land models and that it has a multi-layer subgrid heterogeneity representation that allows us to capture many different modes of variability within an individual grid cell. Uh, and there are at the moment uh, four levels of subgrid heterogeneity that are captured within the model. And uh, it's a very flexible framework that allows us to implement new science in systems, complex systems like Arctic tundra uh, and capture variability and, and explore what modes of variability uh, we really need to be uh, representing in order to improve our predictions. So to take a quick deep dive into the improved inundation dynamics topic that I already mentioned, just giving you a few visuals of uh, what the polygonal tundra looks like in these regions, just to give you a sense of the spatial heterogeneity that we're trying to capture and the importance from uh, the physical properties of albedo and uh, processes of evaporation, as well as all of the vegetation physiology and the underlying uh, soil biogeochemistry is all very closely tied to this uh, very complex physical structure. And we're using multi-scale modeling to try to capture that, including analytical models of very, very fine scale processes occurring on individual polygons within that landscape, for example, uh, and, and looking at the spatial and temporal dynamics of that up to very large gridded regions with uh, hundreds and thousands of polygons uh, operating together and uh, using multiple methods, including some machine learning methods to categorize, characterize, and simulate the processes in those environments. In the end, our objective is to work from the finest scales up to intermediate scales that allow us to arrive at parameterizations that can be applied at the, at the scale of uh, a, a, statistical subgrid representation within a model like ELM. Another example is our uh, investigation of hill slope hydrologic processes. We know that the interaction of terrain, vegetation, snow, as I'll get to in a minute, uh, and permafrost in these environments leads to really complex drainage patterns that change over time that we expect to change even more dramatically under a future uh, climate scenario. And the model as currently configured does not include uh, a lot of subgrid hill slope processes that are necessary to really capture those dynamics. And so we are exploring ways to parameterize uh, those subgrid uh, hill slope processes at the large scale. As I mentioned, snow is an important part of this uh, environment and this inter it interacts with the uh, uh, polygonal landscapes that I already mentioned, it interacts with in the more rugged terrain, it interacts with vegetation, and it is a primary driver of variability in subsurface temperatures uh, seasonally and interannually. And so we are with snow surveys, vegetation surveys, remote sensing, uh, and uh, process modeling, exploring the relationships between snow, vegetation, and terrain elements, and trying to make predictive models. Here's just some examples of the very intensive observations that have been made uh, at multiple sites within uh, the NGArctic domain to try to arrive at uh, a rich data set that allows us to evaluate how the models are doing uh, in, those, in those environments and then to extrapolate that to larger scales. Just a, a short 
a vignette here to, to demonstrate that although we categorize these topics into hill slope processes, inundation, snow, there are multiple interactions. And in the end, we're interested in exploring how all of these improvements, individual improvements in the models uh, work together to arrive at overall process prediction improvements. So in this case, we're looking at how snow water equivalent variability over one of our study watersheds leads to variation in surface and subsurface temperatures uh, and, and how that leads uh, also to variability in ice saturation at different depths in the soil, which controls uh, the abundance and, and uh, types of uh, vegetation communities, controls uh, biogeochemical dynamics, and also uh, over time, controls the uh, variability in surface microtopography that might occur through thermokarsting and uh, other terrain dynamics. We've focused a lot on improved representation of tundra vegetation. There uh, previously were just two vegetation types for all of the Arctic tundra uh, in, in our ELM model. And uh, the blue boxes to the upper right illustrate the, the very much larger than two number of uh, important plant functional types that we are hoping to represent within the model. And uh, this is being done based on extensive field observations and, uh, and model development and evaluation against, uh, against those observations. Showing you an example here of the kinds of data that are being gathered in the field on the left-hand side, uh, the colored bars are illustrating for a range of different vegetation types and different species. What the uh, VC max, which is a measure of photosynthetic rates and photosynthetic potential, what that looks like uh, for uh, a range of different species. And the dashed line uh, underneath all of those colored bars is the way that terrestrial biosphere models have been representing uh, that prior to uh, the kinds of studies that are being done within NG Arctic. So just one illustration of, of the kind of significant improvements that can be made in understanding processes and then representing those processes in our uh, complex models. On the right, uh, another example of that kind of uh, depth of, of investigation where we're looking at the ratio of above ground, uh, below ground to above ground biomass uh, in different uh, vegetation communities. And again, the bars are representing both the variability and the means of uh, the measurements in those different communities. And the dash line is representing the typical uh, value that had been used for that parameter in uh, the baseline model, which obviously is low and doesn't include nearly enough variability. So we're trying to capture now both a better mean across these types, as well as understand the processes that control variability. One of the really interesting uh, community types that we're exploring is the alder shrub community. And uh, it's interesting for a number of reasons. One is that alder is a nitrogen fixing species. And uh, so we're looking in depth at the nodulation of the, uh, of the alder root systems and trying to understand where and when and how that uh, nitrogen fixation is happening across the landscape. Alder is also the, uh, one of the taller, if yeah, I would say the tallest uh, shrub in these landscapes. And so it has a very strong interaction with uh, the physical uh, uh, climate system, including the sort of trapping and accumulation of snow uh, which, as I mentioned before, has a strong impact on uh, soil thermal properties. So it's a very important species uh, together with other shrubby species in this landscape, and we're having a special focus on that. There's also, over time, a significant trend due to ongoing climate changes uh, in the abundance of alder and other shrubs in these communities. We're not just focusing on alder, however, we uh, have a whole range of these vegetation types that we're trying to improve the representation of in the models. And on the left, sort of showing the basic range of uh, processes that are represented in our baseline model. And on the right, 
the uh, actual structure of the communities that we are trying to represent. And uh, Ben Selman, for example, uh, who's working on the project has made some important advances, being able to use the observations gathered by the uh, field teams to uh, improve those simulations of the vegetation processes. And finally, we are in, in this part of the project working toward a pan-Arctic representation of these vegetation types through the use of remote sensing data showing here uh, sort of the first step of that by taking field observations gathered on one of the field sites, the Cougar Rock field site, and uh, using that to train remote sensing uh, model of uh, a, a more extensive landscape representation of the vegetation communities. So I'll finish with just a couple of uh, slides that talk about uh, more broadly the lessons learned as part of the project. What I just went through is maybe the more specific process-based lessons learned, but, but we have some other lessons that we wanted to share with you as well. One is that the, the project has, uh, a hallmark of the project has been to bring modelers to the field and uh, to help uh, to, to, to use the, the, that experience to help everyone understand uh, the, the, the interactions that we're trying to capture. It helps the modelers understand the real world that they're trying to represent. And through discussions that happen in the field, it helps the experimentalists and the empiricists understand the needs uh, as, as interpreted through that modeling lens. That has been uh, wonderful for me as a modeler uh, to be able to get into the field and, and have that experience. And, and I think helpful as well for the whole team to, to engage the modeling community in that way. Uh, as an aside, we are trying to figure out how to bring the experimentalists and the observationalists into the, the modeling world a little bit better as well and uh, developing some, some uh, tools that, that allow that to be more convenient for uh, those people to actually use the models. And hopefully we will develop that more in the future, some pictures of modelers in the field. Another lesson learned is that uh, we're using open and fair data policies uh, through the project, and we have more than 120 Arctic data sets that can be freely accessed through an NG Arctic data portal, and we can get you the information for that if you're interested in exploring that. Uh, and our, our objective is to move data sets from uh, the kind of researcher to the broader uh, project usage and then to the community uh, portal as quickly as possible. An example of what that NG Arctic data portal looks like. There's a, a whole capable team working behind that to uh, make that work smoothly. And the last lesson learned that I'll mention here is that it's been a real focus of the project to maintain a culture of safety throughout the, the uh, decade of, of activity in NG Arctic. And, and we have come to define safety, not just in terms of physical safety, but psychological safety and trust and collaboration. Uh, so we're looking at that safety culture very broadly. And, uh, and we hope that, that we have been successful in that and that uh, we're setting a good example for um, for other projects in that way. And that is really the end of our presentation. Uh, each time we go through these uh, Modex iterations between the modelers and the observationalists, we get a little bit closer to our objective of an improved process understanding and predictive capability uh, for the Pan-Arctic. And I will be glad to stop there and Colleen and I can take your questions.